Leslie, so nice to see you. Very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you as well. So if you can just tell us your, your name, uh, where you live, and your occupation. Yes, my name is Leslie Lady Clipper Bryant. I am um, from the Washington, D.C. area, and I'm the owner of the Lady Clipper Barbershop also look at, located in Washington, D.C. Perfect. Um, so we're gonna go way back. We're gonna start like where things may or may not have started. Um, tell me a little bit about what you were like as a kid. What were some of your likes and interests? As a kid, I was really, really interested in artwork. I loved to draw, um, trace cartoons from the local newspaper. Uh, <laughs> love coloring, that sort of thing. So anything in the art realm, I as a, even as a child, I was just so into. Cra arts and crafts, carving, anything. And um, did you grow up in a creative home? I did. So um, my mom used to make, my mom is a nurse, but on, on the side as a child, she used to sew handmade dolls. And I would often just like, mom, can I help? Or, you know, just kind of assist her and glue things and sew things by hand. So I really enjoyed and loved being a part of her creative process. And I think that had a lot to do with fueling mine. And what were some of your favorite subjects at school? Definitely art class. I'm also a, a, an athlete. So I loved any, you know, physical education, um, I loved anything sports wise, really into basketball, soccer, and I also did a little track and field. Um, those are my things growing up that really attracted me. I wasn't that into the actual schoolwork, <laughs> the, the, the math, the reading, the science, those things actually were quite difficult for me as a child. So I found a lot of peace in, in being good in, in the art world and also being really uh, confident athletically. How did that influence you know, meeting people and connecting with people, being involved in both in team sports and, um, and in the arts in school? I think you know, it has totally impacted how, how I am as a person now because teams, not only team spirit, but being able to work and drive a team is something that I had to pull from, you know, my younger years in life, you know, being on a basketball team, being on a swim team, we have to motivate each other daily and support each other through the, our losses and wins. So definitely think that um, being an athlete has really helped me to be a better boss. And, the, and as far as art and creatively, um, the art world has really trained me to have a very steady hand and see angles and, and shapes and proportions that maybe the untrained eye may miss. And who, who were some of your early influences? I would say definitely coming from, um, you know, a, a hardworking middle-class background. My parents were very instrumental with get, setting values as far as you know, being disciplined and um, very structured background. Um, so I would definitely say my mom was a huge influence as to you know, kind of going after my dream and not really worrying about what the outside, outside noise would say was, was appropriate uh, for my life. Um, I was a graphic designer before owning my barbershop and that was something that I, I loved for a very long time and earning the degree in fine arts was something that I felt like I had to do to make it make myself kind of on the same level of my siblings because they you know they have bachelor's master's degree um, so I felt like I had to do that before I could do something that I really may want to do for the rest of my life. Well, that's interesting. So the norm, like in terms of pursuing art as a major, that's not always like parents' favorite thing to hear. So how did how did that play out in your family? So when I was 
on the college search, um, a lot of my family members went to HBCUs and I was gonna sort of follow that fold. But I went to a, my art teacher took a special interest in me and said, let's go to this portfolio day at this um, art school. And I had never really thought of studying art in college. <laughs> For me, art was a hobby and something that I wanted to just continue to play around with. It was a, it was a safe and happy place for me. Uh, but I never really thought of it on another level of, as a thing that I could earn money from and, and really um, thrive with. And going to the portfolio day, the college that it was at, the, the guy right after seeing my sketches and artwork handed me an application and said, you should apply. And I was blown away that, you know, a, an art professional, uh, seasoned artist could see potential in my doodles. <laughs> and, and I was just, uh, just flattered and took the application home and explained to my mom what had happened. And she said, okay, go ahead and apply. But make sure that you pick something that you that you can get a good job after you graduate. So painting and drawing that not to say you can't, but it would be a lot more work. Self, you know, being an entrepreneur right out of school um, to kind of promote your work or to get into gallery. But my mom was like, you know, try graphic design because it is, you know, com computer related. And at the time, computers were a big thing. Um, technology, the web, when I was in school. So she said, try this and try it on for size and see. And I did, and I fell in love with design. It was the perfect match for me. In what way? In, in the way that I could express art. Um, you know, everything starts with a sketch. And I could also, I also was able to learn technical skills on the computer. Um, and also way, learned ways to how to market and sell my artwork in a commercial way. You know, I learned how to make logos and, I, and, and, and posters and billboards and promotional things that, are, that I currently use those skills to promote my business now. <laughs> so mom said like, pursue, pursue your artwork, pursue your passion, but but also think of it in terms of in terms of your your major or things that you're exploring of you know maybe find something that that is um, I don't want to say practical but you know but that um correct that would be a word that she would have used <laughs> yeah <laughs> so be creative but practical creative yes yeah got it um did you feel any pressure um, that your siblings were following another path? I felt a little bit of um, a little bit of pressure and also a little bit of guilt because the school that everybody, my parent, my mom went to, and my brother and sister went to, they had they have a lot of pride in go going there. So, you know, sort of feeling like I was going against the grain and sort of felt selfish at times. Um, but my mom quickly reassured me and was like, "Look." Everybody's not the same. Every place is not for everyone. So go in, but you better kick butt. <laughs> so um, what were some of your first jobs out of college? So in college, I worked at a company which was an event planning company. And I assisted with um, creating inv custom invitations, wedding invitations, um, event invitations, I should say, because we did bat mitzvahs and all sorts of events. So they, they did really creative um, it, wedding invitations there. And every once in a while, I would have help out at, with events. Okay, so that, was, so that was in college. That was an in-college job. So after you graduated, you have your portfolio, you start applying for jobs. Where did you land? Then I landed at... Um, a couple mom and pop print shops and right away quickly was um, uh, quickly was promoted to manager and basically I ran the whole print shop from start once I learned the ropes I ran the whole print shop from start to finish made sure everything was complete and to my to the owner's satisfaction um, 
So I worked at a, one of those local shops. And then about two years after that, I got my first corporate job <laughs> at a commercial real estate firm in the creative department. And there I did um, sales booklets, um, uh, any, a lot of uh, flyers, pamphlets, stuff, anything to aid with, with, with the sale of office buildings. And how was that feeling for you in terms of expressing your creativity in real estate? At first, I, I was just excited to be in a corporate role and get dressed up to go to work and, you know, sort of the, the glitz and glamour of working in an office, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then when I that wore that. off, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I was excited to have my own desk and a nice office and feel important, you know, uh, validated in, as such. And I stayed in that company for about 12 years. And not, I would say two years in, I started to feel a s sort of, sort of uh, caged a little bit creatively. And, you know, every company has their branding guidelines and, and uh, a system as to the way they, they do things. And when I would every once in a while try to push the envelope within the guidelines, it wasn't always well received. People were sort of like, you know, don't, don't reinvent the wheel. It's been working. Um, we've been winning business this way. You know, leave it as it is. So that was, at times, a little bit tough. Were you pursuing or were you doing any artwork on the side for yourself at that time? So at the time, I would do design, a freelance design work. Here and there, it wasn't cons consistent work uh, because, you know, when you're working a nine to five, sometimes you need those weekends to relax but um, yes I did have I did do some freelance work for companies and also uh, people in my circle had different events and I would do their invitations and and support that way so you're you're at this real estate agency for 12 years two years in you're already feeling a little stifled so what happened when you decided to to leave? Did you already have a vision for this new business? So actually that company merged with another company and they were doing major layoffs. So if it, I was looking at other jobs and trying to find jobs to, um, to move on to during this, these, this 12 year period, but this company had a great system of paying you well. <laughs> so that you, even if you weren't happy, you look at your paycheck on payday and you would stay, you know? So for me, um, it pr took the layoff to, for me to make a shift and to do my own thing. So it was a blessing. It was definitely a blessing for me. Did you always have an interest in hair? So I was, I always had an interest in my hair <laughs> and I had a, and I would often, I would say a, a very minimal interest in actually doing hair, but I love fashion and I love, I, I, I take special pride in my own hair and I, and stuff like that. But I can't say that I had a passion for hair my whole life. No, it was something that, that just came with time. So you left, you left this company and, and then, and then what happened? So left the company, took a month off to kind of gather my, my mind and come up with a game plan. And with the severance pay, I enrolled in barbering school and the idea of even going to barbering school came from my barber. So the month off before, let me back up a little bit before I, um, when, when I got laid off, I went to visit my barber. And he was wondering why, you know, how was I here on a, on a middle of the week getting your hair cut? I was like, I'm going on vacation for a month. I don't have a job. I'm, I got to clear my mind and see where, where I'm going to land. So he had the great, great suggestion. He was like, why don't you go to barbering school? You have a great personality. You're, you're artistic. And really you have the ingredients to become a great barber. Right away, a light bulb went off, and I was like, I thought it would be pretty cool. 
because I didn't at that at that time I didn't know any female barbers, so I was like I could actually brand this. <laughs> Mm -hmm. This is brandable and I could you know, let me let me see if I like this So I went on my month vacation and enrolled, I enrolled before I left um, Came back and went to the first class after the first day of, of class the teacher in the class was said so You know what drives you? Why are you here? You know, are you already a, um, a Stylist or something like that and I and I thought that was the strangest question because why out of me everybody in the class she would ask me that question and he was just like I don't know you look like you belong here you look like you look like I could feel something from you and that little that just that comment I don't really know what that meant it 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 took me to the next level it gave me a boost because it for me it felt like oh someone could see something I couldn't see and really take some interest in me. I'm going to I'm going to keep going. And every day I went to class, I got more and more interested in the in the craft and also the history of barbering um, and would share it with my mom and show her told told her that, you know, did you know that barbers were the first um uh um surgeons? And she was like, "Yes, I did know that." You know, and just kind of sharing my knowledge with her um was a lot of was a lot of lot of fun. So um so as you're taking this, how long was this barber school program? About a year and a half. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. So it's and a lot. So, it was a lot. It was a hard year financially for me. <laughs> so um so do you learn about like how to style and also is through the history of being a barber or barbering? barbering yes. Okay. Yes. So you learn about um, the history. You also learn about, um, you know, bacteriology. There's a little bit of anatomy because we're we're dealing with not only um, hair, but we're dealing with skin because we're in your scalp. We also shave. We're also dealing with, um, you know, so we have to be able to identify um, uh, infections and skin and scalp um, issues. So that we can advise our clients to, you know, you need to go see a dermatologist or we have to also be able to identify what lice looks like and what a ringworm looks like so that we don't infect other people and ourselves. And so in this class, how many women were there? I was surprised in the class that there were a lot there. I would say about five out of a class of uh, about 15, 15 to 20, it was about five women. And I was shocked to see that. Right. Did you think you were going to be the only one, maybe like one other? I didn't think, I thought maybe two others would, would kind of make it through. Right. Okay. So, so as you're, you're learning, are you, are you beginning to have a vision for your business? So as I was learning, I didn't really have a vision um, as to, I just knew I had to finish school, get my license, get in a shop quickly. And because my barber sort of was like, as you, you mentioned, my angel, I knew I could go back to him and say, hey, can I be an apprentice? Or can I, you know, when I get my license, can I work next to you? And if I get stuck, can you nudge and Hand, smoke, you know, give me a little signal um, as to how to improve. And he said, I'll, I'll walk you through all right away. So I didn't know, I didn't even have a thought of how far I could go. I just knew since I had dedicated myself to this path that I needed income and I needed it fast. So when you completed um, your schooling in barbering, did you, what was the next step for you? So when I finished school and I got my license, I went back to my barber and I said, I'm ready, I need a, I need a chair. And so he introduced me to the owner of the shop that he worked in and he was like, yeah, come on, come on down, get your set up. Well, you can start slow and build some clientele and I won't even charge you any booth rent uh, for a first couple of months. And just to get you get your feet in. 
So slowly, one cut at a time, I started getting a little better and more confident. And I would say two months of working at that shop, I got a phone call from a old classmate. And he said, so Leslie, I heard you got your license and you, I haven't seen you in class and I heard you got your license. Are you working in a shop already? And I said, yes, I'm in a, in a shop in my neighborhood and um, I'm gonna see how it goes. He goes, well, um, I actually own a shop and I was going to school with you so that I could uh, learn the skill. So what do you think about coming to see my shop and maybe you could move over there? So I was like, well, what does your shop have to offer that the shop that, you know, that the shop that I'm at didn't? So he was like, come see it. It's brand new. We, you know, the staff there is really um, supportive and I think it'll be a great place for you. So a couple days, a week or two later, I went to visit and I felt such a welcoming uh, vibe from the team. And I was able to point out what chair I wanted to cut it. I was in the second chair. And I don't know if you know anything about uh, hierarchy in the barbershop. The, the chair closest to the door is usually the boss or the manager or the owner's chair. Mm, and then, I did not know that. Yeah. And then the one next to, so it's kind of in rank. The person furthest away is the newest person. So I knew at that point if I were going to switch shops after having about two months of being in the other shop, I was like, look, if I'm going to move, I got to move now because if I build clientele here and then have to move, that might be a, a problem because then I have to start building all over again. And I did like the location of the other shop better. And I thought that I could probably stay there on a, on a, for a longer period of time. The other shop was in my neighborhood and I wasn't always comfortable working in my neighborhood because I knew a lot of my neighbors and sometimes you want to separate home and, um, and work. For sure. So with either of these places or both of these, these, um, barber shops, I'm curious how many female barbers were there, if any, and did you have any reactions you know, to people coming in and having their their hair done by a female barber? So both shops, I was the only uh, female barber and I definitely got a lot of heat, especially the first year in the, in the new shop, in both shops actually, I got a lot of heat. Um, people asking me, um, so are you, you know, are you learning? Like, do you know how to cut? How, how long have you, like questioning me in a, and I know they wouldn't have questioned anybody else in the shop about their experience. Um, I also had an older gentleman come in the shop once and I just greeted him and I asked him, you know, did you, you know, do you have an appointment with somebody or did you, you know, my chair was open, I would be willing to serve him. And he said, oh no, I will never let a woman cut my hair. I'll never let a woman touch my hair. You know, I, uh, and I was like, okay, that's fine. And he kept going and I'm like, sir, it's okay. <laughs> I'm not begging you. I was just trying to help you, you know, you know, it's not a privilege for me. It's, you know, so yeah, I got a lot of that or clients coming in asking my, the barbers to my left or my right, can she cut? Not, not really caring if that was an insult to me. Mm hmm you know. Did you anticipate that or was it surprising? I didn't anticipate um, people being so rude, um, just outwardly rude about, about um, asking about my skill. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I was okay about asking how long I was a barber or uh, very interested in, and felt that it was a cool thing for a woman to do. That, that, that's fine. Um, but I didn't appreciate when they would ask my coworkers if I was any good. Were there other young uh, male barbers in these shops? Yes, there were two other um, new barbers in the shop that never got the heat. Okay, so you knew it wasn't ageism, it was, it was sexism. Absolutely. That you were receiving from, from clientele. 
in both of these shops. And so despite that, do you're you're building up your you're building up your your clientele of of people. And I and I know, I mean, I think in hair in general, like we have a very intimate relationship with the with the person that cuts your hair. There's trust, there's also a bond that you form and there's loyalty. And I'm not sure, but I feel like especially with like the history of of barber shops I feel like that may be even more like a more intimate relationship so I'm wondering if you could speak to that that's just my experience absolutely I always tell people that I not only you know fix your hair but I'm very good at you know sometimes putting back the pieces of your heart at times <laughs> I love touching I love my clients like, you know, uh, the ones that, the, new and old, I just love hearing stories. Um, I have had clients come in crying uh, or I just, or have a story to tell or going through breakups and I pride myself in having something positive or something to cheer them up with. And I think they look forward to that, you know, and also as a barber, it's, it's very important or hairstylist, very important to know when when to say nothing and 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 uh you know kind of read the the body language of your client you know it's kind of the same as like an uber driver mm -hmm. people select those silent rides because sometimes they don't want to talk or they have other things on their mind and they're coming to relax so to read your client and sometimes i'll ask even if it's a client that I always talk to, I'm like, are you in the mood to chit chat today? Or are we, you know, is our mind in other places? So it's really a part of customer service is sort of catering conversation and, you know, learn, know knowing when to pull back sometimes. Right. So active listening and then also just know, just knowing when there doesn't need to be a conversation. Or advice, you know, knowing when your advice is not, you know, welcome. Some people just want you to listen. And sometimes you ask that, you know, do you just want me to listen or do you want my feedback? Right, right. Um, and where does that, like, that seems like maybe it's innate. Like, where, where does that part of your personality come from? I think being a youngest child <laughs> and coming from a, a family where a lot of people have a lot to say about, uh, how you should live your life and how, you know, what's the right thing, what's the wrong thing. I have been particularly sensitive not to put that on other people, not to, you know, a lot of times people, you, you give keep people information and they give you your, their opinion and it's like, no, I'm just sharing. I'm not asking for your opinion. And so a little bit, I think it's just kind of my family history. <laughs> cultural history you know everybody has advice even if I've, I'm just sharing something and I really don't at times I don't appreciate it so I just try to tune into that right and you how many siblings do you have I have two older siblings a male in the middle and a female um, first and we're all four years apart <laughs> oh, wow yeah okay got it when was the first seed planted for your own business? So after working in the shop, the second shop, I, um, the owner slowly was raising my booth rent. And I was like, she, I just started making comfortable money. And every time I make more money, a little, he sees me doing really well, he raises the rent. So it's, you know, I could never get past a certain amount of, of income and I was like, uh, I might need to figure out another, another stream of income or do I become a traveling barber? I thought of all sorts of ways of making extra money. And one day, just sort of doing some reflection, I thought, I can either, let me, let me approach him and see if he needs support because there were some things in his shop that I felt like needed improvement the way he ran the shop, there were some things that he did that I was like, eh, wasn't a fan of, 
But so I would try, I try to work with him to see if these were things he wanted, needed help with. And he wasn't that interested. So I said, maybe I can do this on my own. Maybe I can get one of those salon suites and not only have control of the decor, but I can also have a very private, intimate space for my clients to come. And doing, after doing research there, I realized, I'm like, why am I thinking small? Let, let's, let me open a shop with the potential of ha having other people working with me. So then I not only have my income, but I get some of the commission from them. So basically doing what he's doing. If I'm unhappy with what I'm taking home, I can play the game too. So did you reach out to um, any small business development centers or mentors to help you build this business? So, no, yes, yes and no. So I had um, my mom's old hairstylist, uh, has her own shop, she's very successful, she's been successful for a long time. So I did chat with her about the idea of opening my own shop and she had me over for lunch one day and really kind of gave, put some sense into my head and explained to me like the pros and cons of having my, your own space and the responsibilities and gave me some creative ideas. So from there, I took it upon myself to say, okay, let's, let's see what property costs like to either buy or, or lease. Um, I did that type of research and I also uh, connected with a chamber of commerce and they had a mentorship program where you could have where you could get a mentor that had uh, previously had a business either the business is out of business or it's still going that could kind of help you get started and I met this wonderful lady there who helped me from picking out colors on the walls to <laughs> to helping me sort of plan out um, and budget. Like, what do I need every month to put aside to pay this type of rent? How many employees will I eventually need? And what, what I need to charge? So she really kind of held my hand a lot to kind of give me the, to do the math for me. And okay, so you're gathering all this information. So before the, the, the paint swatches happened, how did you find your your location and um, and did you bootstrap your business or how what did you do in terms of like launching financially? So yeah, definitely bootstrap. I this it, I started my business with five thousand dollars, and of course I was still work. I was working twelve to fifteen hours a day, so five thousand dollars in the savings, but. You know that was that was rolling five thousand because I was still paying bills and living off of that as I was you know um, putting it in. So, and how did you find your location? So the location, another angel, uh, a, fr a college friend of mine, she went to the hair to the to the salon that's located below my shop as a child. Like she and she still goes there, and she has a great the salon owner owns the building that I actually rent from. And she said to me one day, I was telling my friend, I was like, hey, I'm gonna, I'm out spending the day looking at spaces. I was just driving around looking at for lease signs and calling the numbers to see how much rent was in certain neighborhoods that I wanted to be in. And my friend said, well, what neighborhood are you in? And I was like, I'm on, I'm on U Street. And she was like, my hairstylist is on U Street. And I was like, do they have any space available? She was like, she might because she owns a whole building. So I was like, we'll talk to her and see what's available. So she put in a good word for me, um, told them about what my, what my vision was, what my goal was. And about two days later, I walk in, introduce myself and the owner, she was like, you sound like me 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. And I was like, really? She was like, you know, we don't have space available, but I have do have a storage space, a storage space upstairs, if you want to look at it. So I went upstairs and looked at it, and it had just I couldn't really tell because it was just a lot of junk up there, old equipment, hair dryers, and I was like, I'll take it. <laughs> I didn't even know. She was like, well, I haven't even thought of renting it, and I was like, I don't 
care. Like, because it's on a very busy street in D.C., a very historical street. And I was like, I'll take it. Like, you don't have to worry about construction. Just give me a price of what it would cost every month. Um, utilities, give me, get, bundle everything. Let me know. And then can I come back in two weeks and we nego start negotiation? So when I said that, she was just like, oh, she's not messing around. So we had our meeting two, late, two weeks later and I had Pinterest boards of what I, what I wanted the, so the shop to look like. I showed her, you know, this is the money I have in the bank, but it's, you know, continuously building. Um, she didn't even look at those things. She didn't even glance at it. Cause I was like, you know, you want a copy? This is my credit report. She just didn't even look at those things. She just took a chance on me and didn't call a reference. She didn't care. So Angel, what's that, Angel number five? <laughs> okay. I think you're getting um, up there, yeah. Right, I'm mm -hmm. getting up there. Mm -hmm. She just she just really um, took, she took a chance on me and she said, you know, uh, this is the rent that we want. We I even negotiated her a little lower. I was like, okay, I can pay close to that for the first two years, but then after that, I promise I'll pay what you ask. She was fine with that. And it's been a happy relationship ever since. And I've been there for four years now. Wow. So did she look at your portfolio or ask you about your clientele? Nothing. We just had a conversation like you and I are having right now. And she was just like, so what are you trying to do? And I was like, I need a, I'm a barber. I need to, I want to open my own shop. Um, and I want to serve um, in an inclusive fashion. I want the, this barbershop to be like no other. I want us to be able, I want clients to feel like they can jump from chair to chair and not feel uncomfortable. I want clients to, who feel like they're not welcome in, a, in that male, that, you know, man cave of a barbershop. I want them to feel that they're welcome in mine. And I def, my vision is just, you know, I'm going to start with me and I'll slowly build, build out. But really inclusivity is a huge thing for me. One of the reasons I, you know, I love hearing you know, your story and stories of other successful business women that have, you know, taken a chance and followed their vision is, you know, women are great connectors. You know, we we have that 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 innate ability and an, an instinct to connect and to ask for help and ask for support. And I think, you know, like the the only like piece that seems to be missing is like the mentorship or like where do we find information and and really it's just asking for support taking a chance and um and just being open to to new opportunities i was wondering you know you mentioned uh that you know that the rent was going up on your chair so you there was no way for you to move forward but I was wondering if the men coming into the shop um, that didn't want you to cut their or didn't want you to do, you work on their hair if that if if that factored in to you leaving as well no because I've worked at that shop for three years and that I, quickly they realized I could cut and those some of those same people who didn't want me to cut it first were then asking me to cut them and 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 the inside I wanted to say no because I was like oh I thought I, you know I would joke around and I was like I thought I wasn't good enough to cut you a year ago but now you see you know I'm on time and organized you know my skills are up to par uh, now you want me because your barber is not as professional or doesn't run his business the way I do so I got a little bit of revenge <laughs> Um, but very professionally, though. Very much, very much so. Um, I got and, and, and the whole time I'm cutting it, I'm, in my head, I'm like, I'm going to give you the best cut you've ever had in your life, and, so that you you know you can let them know a girl cut you <laughs> when they ask. Mm -hmm. And so for I think that it was a slight motivation with the new shop, but for me it was sort of I felt a need um, to create a, a safe space. And, to, and a creative space for myself that I could call the shots and uh, make that utopia, not only for myself, but for my clients. 
I have an older gentleman uh, client that, and that was a, also a trigger for me. So I guess the theme is angels and triggers. <laughs> he said to me, he said to me after um, a haircut, he said, and he was, he's been, he was coming for me to me about two years. And he said, Leslie, when are you going to get us out of here? You've been here long enough. And I was already planning and looking for space. And it just was like, it was just that him saying that just kind of gave me a push. Like, wow, even my clients are ready to go. Maybe people will follow me. And in that instant, I started collecting emails, um, phone numbers. From that, you know, I changed from, you know, handwriting my appointments to, um, to online system so that I could track my clients. So I did that for about six to nine months to collect as much data as possible. And by the time my shop was open, I was able to calculate that 80% of my clients from one shop came to the, in the, in the first two months came to the new shop. I was floored. I was floored. So like tracking your progress is also something that, that I did, you know, I, I have learned to appreciate. So, you know, I, you mentioned this, but, you know, the Lady Clippers, an all-inclusive women-owned barbershop and, and operated as well. So how did you find, how did you, how did you find the, the women that now, you know, are barbers in your, in your shop? So the, my staff, they all came out of school. They all came out of barbering school and. I have a special connection with one of the owners of the barbering school and I would call him and say, hey, I need a barber. I need a barber with a great attitude <laughs> that's ready to work and can listen to, to who's ready to um, blossom under my instruction. And I was like, only send me the best. And he sent me my first barber, Joe. Um, she had just graduated, just had her license. And she, we, we had a great first interview and I had, it, at first I did not plan for the Lady Clipper Barbershop to be for all women, like all the barbers to be women. But after I hired Joe, it became, clients start saying, hey, I go to an old female barbershop. I would see it in the Instagram comments or, you know, it would say, you know, girl power in the, in the, <laughs> you know, in these little captions and stuff. And I start seeing this theme and I was like, huh. But I also, I think the name Lady Clipper, that the name I was going by Lady Clipper, even at the shop before. So when I opened my shop and I named it Lady Clipper, um, I, the logo was done, the branding was done. It, I, just this bottom part, if you could see where it says barbershop, it used to say barber and stylist. And I just changed the shirt to say barbershop um, when I did open my shop. But Joe came to me first. She worked for a year. I w wanted to make sure I had sort of our guidelines together. Test. She was like my test barber. <laughs> and I called back to school to see if they had one more a year later. And he sent Gabby to me. And I was like, why, you know, why does he keep sending me women? You know? And I think it was a combination of women being attracted to the brand, thinking that Lady Clipper means it's only for female barbers. And maybe the, the person who owned the barbering school thought that. So he thought I only wanted women. So everybody that came to interview and when I posted it online were always women. So I went with it. So I went with it. So, and it's working for me for brand reasons. Uh, we build a great uh, sisterhood. Um, it's a beautiful thing. So sometimes going with the flow does pay off. Right. Yeah. Maybe it was just um, that, that, you know, that there, there was a need and other people saw that need and they saw it in you and what you and what you were creating. I'm being like partially unbeknownst to you. You know. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I love that. It's the um, that's the most beautiful part. Right. So um did you I'm curious, did you create your own branding? Yes, I did my own logo. I um my mom came up with the name Lady Clipper. 
And she as soon did? As she, yes. As soon as she came up with the name, the image of, you know, uh, Rosie the Riveter came to my mind. Mm-hmm. And and I'm like, I'm, I'm going to be Leslie the Riveter, you know? <laughs> I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to use the whole theme and mm-hmm. recreate it and make it my own and, and put my own, as it is, my own stamp on it. So tell me a little bit about that. So you mentioned, and I didn't, I didn't ask you anything else about the paint swatches. So what did you want this space to look like? It seems like you did have a vision for the, the space. So I knew that I, the space, I wanted to be super clean, almost like you're going to a doctor's office, like not 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 plain Jane or anything, but super clean. I wanted people to walk in and and feel like they were, uh, you know. Sometimes neighborhood barbershops can be a little bit grimy and a lot of junk around, and because it's been around for a long a while, and so a lot of trinkets on the countertops, like that stuff would bother me. So I knew I wanted it to have a very clean and sleek look. Um, so most of my walls are sort of in a light gray color trimmed in white um and then our chairs are all red so if you can imagine how the red pops as you walk up the steps you know um and then i also chose um to make the walls light gray because we also have a art gallery that we feature local artists um their artwork and we switch that out every other month so, so tell I knew- me about Tell me about that. How how have you how did you connect with local artists and why why was it important for you to feature their work? So it was very important for me to feature artists at my at my shop because I, me also as an artist, um, exposure is important, you know. And because I was blessed to be successful in my space, I I want to give other fine artists a chance to have exposure and. Where else do you get the level of traffic on a regular basis outside of an art gallery than in a barbershop, a salon? People are always in and out. And I sell a lot of art. So when I, when I, it was also an economical thing. When I moved into my space, I had all these blank gray walls and I'm like, I need some art. <laughs> and I need, I need it to rotate because I get very bored with uh, the same things all the time. So how can we keep the space alive and fresh, support uh, another entrepreneur and helping them to sell their work was like the best way for me to help myself and also help someone else. That's great. So you rotate it, you said on a monthly basis. And how I advertise for it is I just, I put one Instagram flyer out and ever since then, the artist before refers another artist and it's just been rolling since then. I don't really, I don't do a whole lot of searching for people. People have now been spreading the word to help their, you know, fellow artists get it recognition. Grassroots marketing is still alive and well, even, even in the age of social media. I love that. What would you say to girls who feel like they don't fit in or they're, or even to adults that are afraid to pursue their passion? Fitting in is something I would say for someone who doesn't feel like they fit in or are afraid to pursue their passion. All I could say is nothing to, to it, but to do it, you know, really dig deep and try it. If you try it and you don't like it, that's fine. But to never give it a try, you'll never know. And that's, to me, a huge mistake and, and regret, you know? Um, also, you don't feel like you fit in, sometimes that's where your strength is. Your strength is really lies in what makes you different and what makes you unique. You just have to tap in and, and ask, like you said, ask for help and, and support. Um, Justin, it sounds like you, your mom was so supportive and still is supportive. She's helping you out with your name and I'm sure that she's in the shop and, um, so I just, <laughs> yeah. that's what I, that's, 
that's just what I envision. But um, how can how can parents help their kids, you know, pursue their passion or pursue just exploring what they may want to do? I would say really listen to the things that your children say that they enjoy. And as a parent, I think it's important to, just as my, my um, barber mentor who suggested barbering to me, he knew my background. He knew I was an artist. He knew my personality. He knew I was a people person. He put those two together and said, you would be great at this. So sometimes as a child, you just sometimes need somebody to kind of put the pieces together for you. So as a parent, they have to, I think you have to pay attention to the strengths of your children and helping them find a career or a passion that aligns the two. Help them do some research as well. Exposure is key. Exposure is key for sure. And what's the best piece of advice you ever receive about following your, your vision? Don't turn back. You know, the harder it gets, it just keep going, keep pushing. Because, you know, like they say, when the, when the, what they say, um, what's the, what's the saying? <laughs> um, when the times get hard, the, uh, the hard times get going or something like that. I can't remember. When the going saying. gets tough, the tough That's gets it. going. Yes. Yeah, when yeah. the going gets tough, the t tough gets going. And I am a testament to that. You know, there were times, there were times where I couldn't even pay my rent and my mortgage. But I was following this dream and I knew it would pay off. I didn't know how, I didn't know when, but I knew it would pay off. Keep going and like ask for help by someone you admire or who's, who has already, who is already doing something that you're doing or something close to what you, your dream is. Do you speak to female entrepreneurs about your experience? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I consider my staff that I speak to them all day long about how they could get better, how they can grow, why I do certain things, why it's important to keep certain rules. It's not only for me, but to protect them. You know, why am I strict about certain things? You know, it's just all of these things work together. Right. Yeah. I, if you're not doing it already, I, I feel like you should be out there. You know, if, if that's an interest of yours, talking to female entrepreneurs, getting over that, that, that hurdle, like that little voice that's, that says, I can't, I can't do this because X, Y, and Z, especially in male dominated industries. Absolutely. You have to get just... out of your own head. You have to get out of your head because if you don't believe in yourself, no one will. No one will. So what's, what's next for you? What, what are you, are you working on anything new or anything that you're adding to, to your business? So recently added, uh, she's including me a fifth barber. So we're growing continuously growing. Um, and I'm also searching for a second location. So I'm hoping to, to continue to expand the brand and, and elevate the brand. So we can be around supporting other female barbers and entrepreneurs, really, um, as a whole. I'm very open to see what this next space will be. It may be similar to what, I, what I'm doing now, or it may be to another level. I'm like, I've learned, be open, have an open mind and open heart, and you'll be guided.